So you're in section 1.2? Number 15. On the book and then six on the book. Did you write down what you said? No. <laughs> Was it something like determined by inspection? I'm sorry? Was it something like determined by inspection? Yeah, something like that. So um, the first derivative of y was 6y, 5 to the 6, and then y equals 0. Y equals zero equals zero. Okay. Um, so let me show you something in general, and then I'll see if I still have to talk about that one specifically. Um, if Y is X to the eighth, what's DY DX? Zero. Eight X. You guys are all like, he's going to trick us. No, no. This is Y is a function of X. What's DY with respect to X? And it's just a, I love you guys. You're all like, doing? doing something. Um, now watch. What power would I raise y to to make this become x to the seventh? I love it. And uh, what is y? Y is x to the eighth. So what power would I raise that to to make it become x to the seventh? The seventh, seven eighths. Yes, because you would, so 7 eighths power would take an 8 and replace it with a 7, right? What did I do? You kind of, with, you guys see where I'm going now. So really, x to the 7th is actually x to the 8th to the 7 eighths. And what's x to the 8th? Freaking y. You just got to work that back in to the different cube. So this will be 8y to the 7 eighths. So then by inspection, I can say, well, what, what takes an eighth power and replaces it with a seventh power? Oh, differentiation of a polynomial to the eighth power. So now I know kind of like what to guess, and where would that eight have come from? Would it come down, right? So I can guess y equals zero is the trivial solution here, right? It makes both sides zero. It's amazing. Uh, but if I make y equal x to the eighth, does it work? Well, the derivative of, y of x to the eighth is 8x to the 7th, right? And if you put x to the 8th in there, you get 8x to the 7th. Do you guys, do you guys see that? Mm -hmm. I like it. So that kind of problem is easy once you know how to think about it. right? So that's the kind of problem that I expect a question on. Because we're not used determined by inspection. You're like, no, just, just give me some processes. Give me some methods. Screw you. But, you know, no, this is what they mean. Think about what would have that effect on a function. What would replace the power? That's really a way to look at a fractional power is it, re it replaces a power with something else. I like it. Was that funky? Okay. Is that cool? So that's like number 15 in the, in the, in the textbook. Yeah. I like it. Anything about that problem? So that 8y to the 7 eighths, you'd have to switch it for the, in the respect of y now. So what they're saying is they give you the they give you this. And they say, you know, y equals zero is an answer. What's another answer? So another answer would be this. If y is x to the eighth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. In fact, well, I mean that is an answer, right? But I could actually give any multiple here and it would still work. Do you guys see that? So it could be c x to the eighth, a family of answers. Aw. Little family. Are you guys doing all right? I love you guys. I, you're all like, I, like I always say, I don't want to play poker with any of you. I would need major, I, I get a good hand. <laughs> so that's, you know, you'd think I could make a lot of money playing poker. I know all the pot odds and all that shit, but no, I'd have to play online, and even then I'd be typing, yeah, oh, sure, sure. All right, so anything, is that... Decent, you guys. Does that help you? Do you can you figure yeah. yours out? Yeah. I mean, it's basically yeah, the same idea. I love it. Okay, okay. So anything else from homework stuff? What was that one? Was that the one? Uh, no, it was something different. Um, which one? I had two. Yeah. The one was the uh, partial. The oh, okay. That's what made me do this, the, the handout. But I think it was this one I was asking to make <laughs> yeah. sure I did. Okay. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. I got you. Uh, okay. So nothing else from homework? You guys are doing okay?
Uh, I've noticed maybe about three people that have signed up for the online have, have done have done something. Uh, hopefully, you understand what you sign up for. You have to you have to get in there and do it. Um, also, if you did temporary access or something, it's only for two weeks, so you need to buy full access if you're on the uh, web assigned stuff. If you're doing old style, old time paper pencil out of the textbook, I love you. That's beautiful. Turn it in. Uh, as soon as you get it done, you don't have to turn in a whole chapter. You can give me section one one, section one two, section one three. That's awesome. Yeah. So if we do web assign, we don't have to turn in. No, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we do web assign, do you agree on how much we get, correct? No, I um, I do the same thing with the textbook. I, in the textbook, I allow you to make some mistakes and you still stay at full credit because we're human. We're going to make some mistakes. What I'm mostly checking for is the concept. So on WebAssign, I have a few problems that I desperately have to see you get right, and then I allow you to make like uh, anywhere down to like 80%, depending on the assignment, and you still get full credit. It's basically what I do with the textbook, to be honest. Um, so really, it's all about trying the problems, applying the correct process at the right time, those kind of things, right? Uh, there's certain mistakes that tell me you're doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, so I know to look for those. Okay. Anything else from homework stuff at all? Web assign or the textbook? <coughs> you guys doing all right? Were you freaked out by the rain? It was raining earlier. It's just like, okay, I'm cool with that. If it cools down. Uh, okay. So there's no other questions from homework. We're just going to keep on going. Um, section 1.3 is interesting. Let me put it up here. Where'd you go? There you are. Oh, let me just do it this way. I got it. It's a new book, but who cares? One three, I like for a few different reasons. Uh, one three is the uh, where's this stuff show up in real life section. Um, I always have a problem with that because math itself is a part of real life, so. Screw that question, but hopefully at this level, some of you guys, at least a few of you guys agree with me. Uh, if you don't, it's all right. Can somebody do that? Thanks, man. Oh, yeah. All right. Turn that other one. Oh, are they off now forever? Freaky. Can you only do <laughs> That's all right, right there. I think that's fine. Uh, let's see. So 1.3, this is the new book. It's a little bit different format, but it's the same thing, basically. Um, it talks about, it talks at a very high level about modeling things. You've been modeling things since algebra, right? You model the situation of three consecutive integers add to be 78. So it'd be, you know, n plus n plus 1 plus n plus, you know, you're modeling that situation. Um, getting into the real force here, now, this is one of the, most often studied, and it's just a classic example of uh, population growth, right? So what is population growth fueled by? Why would a population grow faster than some other population? Because there's more people in the population. So the larger your population, the, the larger the rate of increase of the population should be. Now, is that the only factor that affects the rate of increase of a population? No, when you talk about humans, you can have interesting effects by, I don't know, what's in the water, can either increase or decrease libido, whatever, right? And then beyond that, who knows? Right? Just, just cultural norms and all this other stuff. But on a very, very fundamental level, there are certain things that act pretty close to this idea of the rate of change of the population is equal to some constant times the population size itself, right? This section is a little bit frustrating. In fact, the whole first chapter as a student, it's got to be a little frustrating to be like, good. so here's the solution. No, I want to get the solution. I want to solve this thing. So don't worry. Those days are coming, and you'll be wishing it wasn't here. But um, 
We have also decay, which I love to just make it an A for amount, I guess. And if it's decay, what's going to be true about K, do you think? It's got to be negative, right? Um, where am I going here? Blah, blah, blah. Here's Newton's law of cooling and warming. Do you really have to understand the physics behind it? No, but some of you guys have certainly talked about it. So, of course, a, a body's going to warm up or cool down quicker the bigger the difference in between itself and the ambient temperature, right? And that's basically what that says. The difference in the ambient temperature and the temperature of the thing I'm looking at times some constant is equal to how quickly the temperature changes over time. I mean, that's, so the, what this is trying to say is you can model a situation using theory, come up with the equation that answers that theory, but then what do we normally do? We actually, what's called perturbation theory, which is make it fit better and better and better in real life. Figure out what variables that we leave out. You might have to go back and start over here, or you might be able to throw in those variables later. You guys kind of follow? So this, this doesn't even get anywhere near that. It's just showing you some things that happen in real life that are differential equations. Right? Uh, and they get a little bit more interesting when you get to you know, uh, electricity. Where's my electricity? Here we got some mixtures, uh, blah, blah, blah. I mean, and look for your examples. Especially in this section, they're going to give you examples. You got 60 gallons in there, and it's flowing out at this rate, and so forth. You got examples that you just have to plug stuff into. So this section shouldn't be too evil, unless you just try to do the problems and not even look at these. Then it would be very evil. Uh, here's my Kirchhoff. Anybody did you know Kirchhoff? Anybody? A few of you guys. All right. All right. I don't know how you feel about them, but. Um, Current is just the rate of change of charges as they move by, how quickly the charges flow. So if I have inductance is related to the rate of change of current, so it's going to be the second derivative of the charge. You guys, so now I've got a second order differential equation when it comes to uh, LRC circuits. You guys have ever done LRC circuit? Yeah, cool. We try to find the right frequency to kind of get it balanced. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Then good old Isaac Newton, we've got to give a nod of the hat to good old Isaac Newton, kinematics. This is kind of stuff that you see in every calculus course. When we first introduce slope, we kind of start with velocity just because it's more something we can really hang on to. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Let's see, anything else interesting here? A little cartoon with Einstein. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so, the, you know, the... The homework is going to be situations. Let me show you this one thing, for example. Uh, where are you? Yeah, here we go. Large mixing tank holds 300 gallons in which 50 pounds of salt. Pure water is pumped in the tank at a rate of 3 gallons per minute, blah, blah, blah. That's a plug and chug situation. You go back to the example. So on one level, it's nice because there's not a lot of um, uh, derivation that you yourself have to do. But I'm hoping that also frustrates some of you a bit. I should frustrate you a bit, but they're just trying to show you in, in real life, in physical situations, where do these things come from. Um, okay, that's all I want to say about section 1-3, to be honest. Until you get into it and try it out and ask me some specific questions, that's all I'm going to say about it. So it's weird. Do you have any questions on 1-3? Like, we don't know yet. Okay. As far as I know, nobody's got into it yet. Um, okay. So now that we have one three out of the way, let's get into some good stuff. I like watching Jeff do this forever. Okay. So let me show you something. If you've done 281, this should feel very familiar in a way. Um, can you bring the lights back? Thanks, man. All right, so here's kind of what we're dealing with in general. For uh, uh, what can you tell me about this DE? It's what can you tell me? Anything? Can you classify it in some way? It's first order. Right? First order. 
That's really all we can say, because we don't know what this function does to y, so we can't say if it's linear or not. I like it. Cool. So all I can say at the moment is it's first order. Um, notice, though, what's a good name for that function considering what it equals? I mean, that's, what does dy dx mean? What does it represent? Slope. So a good name for this would be the slope function. It's crazy. Um, so, so one way to kind of think about, and, and that's exactly, by the way, not just me making fun of stuff. It's, that's the slope function. So it makes sense. This is a function that regulates the slope. That's what the slope is equal to. Um, so, for example, if I had, let's say like this. If I had dy dx, if this pops up in the book every now and again, 0.2 of xy times xy. And so this is f of xy. And I think, let's say, at the point, uh, doesn't really, really matter, at the point uh, 2, 3, what's the value of f of xy? Yeah, so this would be dy dx would equal 0.2 times 2 times 3. So it would be 1.2. I like it. What the hell does that mean? So that's the slope at yeah, that's the slope at 2, 2. two 3. I like it. So this is where it's going to feel very similar to something you might have done in 281. We did stuff called vector fields. You've got to be really careful. That's not what this is. It's not a vector field. So if you don't know anything about vector fields, you're perfectly right where you should be. Don't worry. If you do, you actually got to push that out a little tiny bit. Uh, what this is going to lead to, now I could do that at every point on the xy plane. Because this thing is defined at every point on the xy plane. And I could draw a little what's called a lineal, you'll love this, lineal element at the point 2, 3, with a slope of 1.2. So that's, if you've done vector fields, it kind of feels familiar, but it's not. That's not exactly what this is. So at the point 2, 3, I could draw a little lineal element. It's not a slope of 1. It's a little bit more than 1, so it's 1.2. Sure. There you go. And you could do that for every point in the xy plane or in the interval over which or in the uh, region over which this exists, if there's some trouble somewhere. This is cool everywhere. All right. So you get stuff like this. Um, I should have kept that on. It's too bad for me. Turn the light out, do we? So there's the point two, three, roughly. I don't know where there two, three is. This isn't really tick marks, but oh well. Two, three, and there's like a uh, 1.2. Ah, uh, see, that's what I just said, but not uh, kind of. Not really. Do you guys see the difference? It's not even a gradient field, if you know what that means. It feels the same, and you can treat it the same in a few different situations, and but it's not really a vector field. It's not the output here is not a vector. The output here is actually a number that I, dem that I use a line to, to show. Do you, you guys see? But it's better than writing a little 1.2 there. Right? And, and, and here's the, the idea. Uh, if I give you a point through which the answer is supposed to go, so, so when I find the answer to a differential equation, it could have a constant that would represent uh, just the up or down shift, a constant that would represent a, a stretch vertically or a stretch horizontally. It, that constant, depending on where it is, could represent any kind of graphical change. Are you with me? So the solution to a differential equation is normally a family of functions right? that are all related through some constant. They've got the base, same basic, like e to the x squared, but there's a c in front of it that would affect its uh, how quickly it rises or falls, or so forth. Or if it's up here, if it's down below. Are you guys with me? So, uh, if I knew that f of zero was one, I could then sketch what the answer looks like if I had this field done already. 
So I could start here and it would push me this way and that would push me this way and that would push me this way. Do you guys kind of get the idea here? So, uh, I can't remember what they say. So they say, oh, just to show you, there's, some, there's several possible solution curves based on what my initial value would be. Let me just stop here. Let me, we've talked about initial value problems a bit before. So my solutions now could be a bunch of curves. Because it's just the relationship between the slopes and the values at different points. That's what a differential equation really is. It, it involves relating the rates of the slopes to values at different points. Are you guys semi with me? All right. So if I said, for example, a really easy example. Dy dx equals 2. What does that mean? Slope, 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 slope is 2. So the answer has got to be, got to look like, I heard somebody say, what's well, the only thing that's got a constant slope of 2? A line. In fact, the form of the answer is going to have to be 2 x plus C. So what are the family, what's the family look like? Right, and everywhere in between. What's the C control? Which line I'm talking about? How much up or down I go from zero? Are you guys with me? Now, depending on the type of function that you get as an answer, it couldn't, it doesn't just have to represent up and down. It doesn't have to represent left and right translation. It could also represent shifting and stretching. All the translations you've talked about ever depending on where the C ends up. And C could be anything, right? Or yeah, well, it depends. It sort of depends on um, if it's an initial value problem, C is going to be determined. But even if it's not an initial value problem, there might be some restrictions on C. Gotcha. We'll have to wait and see. You're talking about the subject to? The subject to the yeah, yeah. If, if there's an initial value problem, obviously I can solve exactly for C. But even without initial value, there could be some some values we have to eliminate. We saw that before. I can't remember how big of a point I made about this. Remember the um, implicit solution we found? Uh, was uh, x squared plus y squared equals c squared? I can't remember if I got these the right way around. I think I do. Okay. Um, but here, of course, c wouldn't make any sense if it was, it's not c squared, sorry. c wouldn't make any sense if it was zero, if it was less than zero, right? So there are certain situations that restrictions on my constant uh, are because of the geometry of the problem. Okay. All right, all right. How often does it happen? We'll see. We, that's part of what we have to learn this semester is what to look for to tell me if there are restrictions on my constant. Okay, so does that, this is like that. That's different values of C. This is different values of C. Is, is that cool? So if I told you uh, F of zero, you know, Y of zero has to be three, then this would be, the, that's the solution curve. That's the curve that goes through that point that's the answer then. That's what an IVP does. So if I have a differential equation by itself, these are all valid answers. Right? In fact, the way it's written, uh, I think they give you the solution here is CE to the X squared or something. Um, but when I have an IVP, when I have an initial value, the answer is going to be the one that goes through that point. Now, in general, there actually could be more than one unless you meet the requirements of that existence and uniqueness theorem, there might be just one. You can tell that there's just one answer. All right, let me stop there for a second. I love you guys, you're like, how do I feel? How am I supposed to feel right now? I don't know. Um, this is a class where if you're not used to reading the book, you get over that quick and you read the freaking book. And you make sure you can make sense out of every step they make in any theorem and any example they have worked out. You make sure you can figure out every step. If you haven't been doing that for yourself so far, you've been lucky to get here, really, to be honest. All right? So anyway, that's my little public service now.
Okay. Um, so what's nice, just to let you know, because you can imagine, can you imagine creating a, what's called, this is called a direction field or a slope field. Creating a slope field for a given situation by hand would be disgusting. There's only two problems in the homework to ask you to do it, and I can't really remember off the top of my head if I assigned one of them, so we'll see. Right? Most of the time, you have a field created for you by a computer program, and then you kind of run from there. Or you just don't use a field at all, and you solve the thing directly using methods we're going to learn later. So do you need a direction field, a slope field, to solve something? Not necessarily. Sometimes you actually might. Okay. Um, oh. So here they call it direction field. I think they do say it could also be called a slope field. Um, what did I want to do? I want to do a specific example with you guys. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Okay. So let's focus on a specific type of differential equation. I think I said this word before. Let me know if that's not true. Autonomous first order D's. Now, if I say the word autonomous, do you guys know what autonomous means? Sort of, not really. Autonomous. Like an autonomous government would be a government runs itself. runs itself. I love it. So this would bless you. So an autonomous DE would be one where the uh, dependent variable controls its own derivative. What do I mean by that? It would, this would have to equal a function of y alone. So that's what's called an autonomous differential equation. So now. Think about the implications of this. Drawing a slope field, a, a, a direction field, sucks in general. Why would this one be a little bit better? Why would me making you draw a slope field for an autonomous DE be better than just for some general DE? What do you think? What about the inputs? The slope. So why was the other one this one? Why did this one suck so freaking bad? If I really, if I made you create the whole thing, you know, maybe out to 10, negative 10, 10, negative 10, right? I'm like, well, see, I didn't go to infinity. So, but still, this would so desperately suck because you'd have to do 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3. You have to plug them all in this shit, right? Because this, de it depends on both the x and the y. So as I move in one or the other direction, things change. What about this one? Just depends on y only. So as I move in the x direction, it's not going to change. So if I figure out, for example, if I figure out right here, it's like this. Then right here is like that also. And right here is like that also. And right here. Right. Right, guys, let me make sure. Because as I move in the x direction, does the slope change? No, it doesn't. This isn't a partial derivative, but do you see how I mean? If you know partials, it makes a little more sense what I'm talking about. So then if this one is like this, then this one's like this, and this one's like this. So what we end up doing for autonomous differential equations is we create what's called a phase portrait. Oh, OK. All right? You don't have to go to Sears or anything. Um, we do just this, right? And, and let's even get a little bit deeper. Let's say, th th does that kind of make sense by itself? Because if I figure this out, if I figure out what the slope is doing, then it's just going to repeat forever in both directions. All right. So that's sort of what this phase portrait is. Now let's see how it really normally is done. I don't normally do the specific slopes in the middle. I'll show you what's normally done. Actually, let me take a very specific example for once here. Oh, what do you want to do, Jeff? Sure. Oh, let me, let me do a few uh, definitions here. A few. We're going to assume in this whole section 2.1, 
when they're talking about autonomous DEs, that F and F prime are continuous. Anybody know what that relates to? What I can use then, if I know those two things. Okay, so what, what does the existence and uniqueness theorem say? You're like, probably that, Jeff. Uniqueness and then. You take the partial F. Ah, and since this is only a function of Y, that becomes a complete derivative with respect to Y. Like here, F prime has to relate to Y because that's the only thing it's a function of. I like it. So this requirement, this assumption is based, is related to the existence and uniqueness theorem. You guys with me? So if you read through the book and you get to this part, you'll see them say this, and you're like, oh yeah. Um, now what if for y equals c, f of c is 0? So if for some value of y you get 0, now, now think back to math 180, right? Remember how hard you thought that was and now like, what? You had no idea past you. Um, what does that mean? What would c be? Why would I call it c? 180, um, when you find something that makes the, the, and what is F again? F is actually the derivative. derivative. So when the derivative is zero, we call the point where it's zero, we call that a, you know, for, starts with letter C, we call it a critical point. So we still call it a critical point, thank God. Just to make that relation for you, that's, exactly, that's why we're still calling it critical, that's what it is. It's, the, it's a value that makes the derivative of zero, right? Also undefined, but we're not considering that right now. Um, blah, blah, blah. We also call this, you'll see why in a minute, an equilibrium point or a stationary point. Because if the slope is zero, and I showed you earlier how you could follow the, the arrows, so once you add a slope of zero, what are you, where are you going to go? You're going to just go straight. So that's why we call it an equilibrium stationary point. I like it. If you start there, you can't escape there. A critical point means there's a max and minimum or a satellite, right? Well, critical points are just locations of possible those. Oh, possible. Right? Yes. Good. All right. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Oh, note this. Uh, the whole point of solving this is finding a uh, y function that makes it work. So if f of c equals 0, that makes this thing work, then y equals c is a solution to this. So for example, that's the trivial solution, right? So here's a, a concrete example. Because um, what's dy dx if y is a constant? What's the derivative of a constant? Zero. zero. And f of c is zero, so that's a solution to the, it makes it work. It's the trivial solution, right? So here's my concrete example I promised earlier, and I'm finally going to give you. I, I was told there'd be concrete examples. can you do with, with this, considering what we were just talking about? So what do you think I'm trying to find? So again, it's all about finding points that make this zero. That's, that's it. So what do you do? Yeah, or you, know, you can work within the equation itself and you just have to Comes a y. Okay, okay. I love you guys. So yeah, you can set equal to zero. There's no reason to set that up. Work within the equation itself. Just rewrite it in a better form. What are my critical numbers? 
So there are two solutions already to the differential equation. They are admittedly the trivial solutions. But hey, there's two solutions, shit. So it's just an infinite number more to find. Right? Um, so we're not going to find all of them right now. All we're going to do right now is use this information. Now th this is where you got to really go with me for a little while. We're going to use this information to see what the answer looks like. And then I'm actually going to finally show you how to solve this stupid equation. We're going to get the other freaking answers, and we're going to compare it to what we predicted the stupid things would look like. That should be interesting to you. We're going to predict what the answers look like, get the freaking answers, see if they look like the way they're supposed to, and then we'll move on. Right? Sounds nice. So I know I can do this. Is this autonomous? Yes, because it's only dependent on y on that side. I like it. I like it. It's not dependent on x. Um, and this should feel very familiar, except it's just now it's vertical instead of horizontal. Do you remember all the times you had to do the plus and minus kind of sign diagram? Do you remember those? You had to find where it's equal to zero, and that's where it would be uh, possible max or min, and is it going down, is it going up? Do you remember all that stuff? Do you remember those days? And you're like, man, those are good days. Uh, so the same kind of thing here, zero and two. I want you to realize something. What happens at those points? What happens if I'm y equals 2? If I am this, the function y equals 2, what am I going to look like? Okay, well, I'm just going to look flat, right? And that course, corresponds to that having a, a zero derivative. Of course, we know that, right? Those are trivial solutions. They're easy to think about. So I kind of I don't really always put this on my face porches, but that's going to come in handy in a minute. The phase portrait is the, the vertical line, and then what I'm about to put on the vertical line. The little dotted lines are a little extra thing I'm going to do on top of it. The book does the same thing. Um, now, very similar to what you did before, at 3, what's the value of the slope? Is it positive or negative for a value for a 3? And again, this is the y-axis here, right? I mean, you've got to keep telling yourself what's happening. We don't give a shit about x because this doesn't give a shit about x. So at 3, slope is positive. That means the function would be? No. It means the function would be increasing. I like it. Increasing. In here, decreasing. In fact, you guys might remember multiplicity. If I say that, does anybody know what I mean? Multiplicity, not just the movie with Michael Keaton. You should look it up. This is actually pretty good. This is to a first power. This is to a first power. They're going to alternate between the regions what they do. If you didn't know that, I'm sorry. Pre-calc, calc would have been so much easier if you knew that. If you put a 1 in, it's negative. If you put a negative something in, it's positive. I like it. Now, now here's what's nifty about this. Um, There's only so many possibilities for what the thing looks like in each region. Um, if I was, uh, just imagine what's happening here. What's the value of the slope at this point? Zero. Zero. As I move away from it, it's going to get more and more positive. positive. You with me? So if I start here, I'm going to go up. Right? So let's say if I start here, where am I going to go? I'm going to go up, 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 and keep going up even faster because as I move up, the slope gets bigger. As I move up, the slope gets bigger. Oh, shit. And if you think about it in reverse, this is going to be asymptotic here, right? Let me stop there for a second. So, so this is interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm sketching what the answer looks like before I even know what the answer is, right? And again, this is all new. This is... You've got to read through this section, but it's not as difficult as it sounds. I don't care how good somebody is explaining it. So you kind of get through it yourself. You're going to, you'll see what I mean. But it's really all based on the fact that this only cares about y. So if I know what y is doing, I know what the function is doing. Um, what about in here? It's always decreasing. So it's going to, if I start here, it's going to decrease and go like that. 
And then it's got to be asymptotic again. Are you with me? So it kind of controls what that thing can look like. I like it. And then what about here? Yeah, and it's going to increase. And, it's, and the slope, though, it's, it's increasing, but as it gets closer to this, what's happening to the slope is still positive, but it's getting smaller because it's zero here. I mean, that's, that's, the whole, that's why I can sketch the way I'm sketching. I know what this is going to look like. This is so freaky. Um, so it's got, it's got to start off a big positive slope, and then it's going to decrease as you go. So let me see if these definitions make sense just from this picture up here. I would call zero an attractor. I would call zero an attractor and I would call it state. Attractors are always state. Me, do I have any other options for color? No. Oh, too many. So attractor and state. What about this? And it's always as I move uh, from negative to positive x, when I move towards the right. That's how we read. So that's an attractor. You can't go, who oh, repels this way? No. So what do you think this one would be called? Repeller. I love it. Oh, shit. Now I can show off my excellent spelling skills. Is that an E or an O? Well, I'll do both. There you go. Repeller. So this is uh, <laughs> unstable. Now, that's not every situation, right? What's the other situations that I haven't, that this function just happened to not display? Just to kind of close the door on all the possible words I can use. There's really just one other situation. Either it's uh, going away from it on both sides, so it's repelling, or it's coming towards it on both sides, so it's attracting, or it's a mixture. Right? And the mixtures, you can think of it as two situations, really just one situation. So either it's this, where you have a, a critical point like that, or it's this, where you have a critical point like that. Do you agree with me that's the same, really? We call this semi-stable. Why? Because, for example, here, if I start here, what would I do? Decreasing, but it's getting closer to zero, so I would do this. So that would act like an attractor on that side. But if I start here, what's it going to do? It's going to decrease. Ah! So then it's repeller. So we call it semi-stable because it depends on what side you start on. So this is called semi-state. It's not an attractor or a repeller. It's sort of both and neither at the same time. Depends on which side you start off on. And then similar thing here. Is that, is that cool? So if they're coming together, that's an attractor. Going apart, that's a repeller. Kind of going you know, the same way on both sides, that's kind of parts of both. So we call it semi-stable. Right? It sounds like some people in our lab. Okay. Or not, I guess. Okay. I only hang out with people that are stable or unstable. Okay. Um, <coughs> oh, let's go back to the let's go back to my my um, what do you call it, my uh, uh, promise to show you how to solve this thing. Uh, and this is kind of nice because it kind of bleeds into the next section a little bit. Um, how do you solve this DE? Now that we've got, this is what I think it's going to look like. Now, now, remember the first night, I think, we talked about the general solution has got to be one of these three intervals because it can't include something where it's discontinuous. So it really depends on what my initial value would be as to which one of these the answer would be. You guys with me a little bit. And of course, this is the shape of it. It could be moved left and right depending on what my initial value is. Okay, I like it. And in fact, they have a whole theorem about, I can't remember what they call it, the translation. I love these people. Sorry, Zill is actually pretty good, but oh well. Um, so how do I solve this stupid thing? Well, this is beautiful. This is an example of what we call separable. And this is one of the simple, simpler separable ones. Can I get all my Y stuff together on one side? Yes. Can I get all my X stuff together on one side? Yes. I can multiply the DX up and I can divide that shit down. So I get, I'll get out of here. Well, not yet.
Cool? So we're really, really creative math people, and we said we could separate it so it's called separable. So that's what we call separable. It's beautiful. And then, of course, I can do like I just did. Integrate both sides. So this is the most basic way to solve a DE is if it's separable. I can just directly attack it with intervals. It's so when it's not separable and the things are kind of attached like, oh, shit, I need some freaky way to do this. So who knows how to do this one? This might be related to something we did on the first day. Not U sub. Or, I mean, what kind of U sub would you try? Oh, I see. Okay, you could do by parts maybe if you want to try that. I would rather do partial fractions. Right? That's not a lot of our first go. Partial fractions really shouldn't bother you as much as it does. Partial fractions, then you just sink your teeth into. It's not vague or amorphous. It's freaking do this, 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 answer. Do this, 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 answer. You got it. You should love that shit. Or you should hate it, but just be able to do it. Right? Um, so this is 1 over y times y minus 2. I'll do this side. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? So real quick, partial fractions. What's it got to equal? What's the form of it have to be? This one's in your face. Yeah, it must have come from something over y plus something over y minus 2. So 1 equals a times y minus 2 plus b times y. When you multiply that up, it just picks up the one it doesn't have. If uh, So we can, just, I mean, there's, either way it's going to be pretty quick. a plus b has to be 0. Is that cool? a plus b has to be 0. There's no y terms. And negative 2a has to be 1. So a is negative 1 half. So b has to be... Is everybody cool with that? Negative 2a? is the only constant term on that side. So it's got to equal the constant term on this side. A plus B is the Y term. Are there any Y terms? No. So A plus B is 0 because there's no Y terms. Negative 2A has to be 1 because it's the only constant term. A is negative 1 half, so B must be positive 1 half. I like it. So what does this integral become now? It becomes integral, uh, let's pull a 1 half out front. B is positive, so it's 1 over y minus 2 minus 1 over y. Let me let you guys think about that. If I plug the B and the A back in, I pull the 1 half out front. Oh, shit. Now, hope to God this is very easy. These are both linear with slopes of 1. Shit. What is the integral of 1 over y minus 2? Ln. I haven't heard it yet. Absolute value y minus two minus ln absolute value y equals x plus c. Yes. The first part did you just like flip the function because you pulled the dx out or something like did you make it like one over dx equals why did you flip? Oh, I just multiply the dx up here and then divided this down there. Just to get, and again, you can see that separate. Get the x stuff on the one side, get the y stuff on the other. You want your dx and your dy up so they can become the part of the interval, right? So dx stuff on that side, y stuff on that side. Yes? Explain what you did right there. You said negative 2a. No. Oh, yeah, so if you distribute this, you get ay plus by minus 2a. Right. A plus B has to be 0 because there's no Y terms. Okay. Negative 2A has to be 1. Right. Yeah. You could have also said if Y equals 0, if Y equals 2, and do it that way, the way we did it the other day. I figured the equation would be quick. All right. So I want to show you real quick what this looks like if you graph it. Oh, you're alive. So I'm going to use my old friend Desmos. Desmos. Not these mops, Jeff. Desmos. That's always good, Jeff. 
Come on, screen. <laughs> One more time. Are you done? You're like, I should be getting paid. All right. All right so now, if I if I do, in fact, real quick, if I leave those lights off, don't worry. If uh, if y is uh, one, what would this side be? We can do it, we can do it, yeah. If y is one, natural log of one is absolute value, right? That's why you put absolute values there, because you don't know it's not a definite interval. You don't know what side you're on, so you have to put the absolute values there to save your ass. So one minus two, negative one, absolute value, so natural log of one is zero, natural log of one is zero, this side is zero, and if I say x is also 0, so if my initial condition is it's got to go through the point 0, 1, then c is zero. 0. Sweet. So let me graph gather. Let me graph this, and let's see what that looks like. It should look like this is my claim. Let's see if Jeff has any sanity left in him. x equals 1 half times gather. Don't guess what I'm trying to do. One half times natural log of the absolute value of y minus two. Oops. Yes. Minus natural log of absolute value of y. I think that's right. Okay. How's that look? Hey, look at that. Respond to my request. Okay. Look, look at that. Let me zoom in a bit. Versus the face portrait with the additional. So without this stuff, just the line and the arrows. That's the face portrait. I put on top a sketch according to that face portrait of what the answer should look like. It's freaking that, isn't it? <laughs> we basically did this together. I didn't really force you to agree with me on this. You guys agreed with me. That's the way it would make sense. This is so freaking nice to see. And if I chose, now notice, what point does it go through? Zero, one, right? Zero, one. So if I chose a different initial condition, all that would do is move it over or back. <laughs> the Y shit can't change. 